Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Sandra Garigou. Uh, I'm uh, working at uh, Institut Paris Région as a project manager on uh, adaptation to uh, climate change. Um, I work in the climate energy uh, department and uh, this morning I will uh, animate this uh, webinar with my colleague uh, Francisca. Uh, could you introduce yourself please, Francisca? Yes, thank you, Sandra. So um, my name is Franziska Bahnhusen and uh, yeah, I'm, a, as Sandra said, I'm a colleague um, of hers at the um, Regional Energy and Climate Agency of the Ile-de-France region. Um, and uh, yeah, also working on the issues of uh, adaptation as well as on the um, issues of uh, building energy retrofit. Uh, and so we will be presenting um, both of us uh, today uh, in this webinar. So uh, welcome and thank you so much for um, connecting with us today. Thank you, Francesca. Um, so this uh, webinar is uh, organized in a framework of a European project Horizon 2020 uh, called Energy Watch. Uh, some of my colleagues uh, uh, participating and coordinating this uh, project are connecting this morning uh, with us. Uh, as uh, Marie-Laure Falcomassé and uh, Sabina uh, Hakim, um, maybe Sabina, uh, you, would you like to take uh, to say some words about this uh, uh, European project? Uh, good morning. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I would like to uh, to do so, and I would also like to share just uh, a few uh, slides uh, that uh, that I have here. Just one second. I believe this is shared with you. Uh, is it uh, is it right, uh, Sandra? It works. Yes, it's OK. Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> my name is Sabina Akim and I am from uh, FEDAREN, the European Federation of um, <clears throat> Agencies and Regions for uh, Energy and Environment. Um, I'm happy to welcome everyone to uh, to the Energy Watch uh, crash course. Uh, and Energy Watch uh, is indeed a European project, uh, project supported by uh, Horizon 2020. Uh, and that's a project dedicated for peer uh, peer to peer learning in regional and uh, uh, and local for regional and local authorities. And it is for uh, for the authorities to be able to uh, timely and accurately define, monitor, verify their uh, sustainable actions. And uh, the consortium behind the Energy Watch project, it's uh, it's bringing together experts from seven European energy agencies, um, one university, the University of uh, of Piraeus, one European network, this is Fedaren, uh, and the Institute. <clears throat> for European uh, uh, Energy and Climate Policy. Um, and uh, the last one is the coordinator. And in our project, we developed four energy and climate data courses, and all of them were uh, not only developed, but they're also always delivered by four energy agencies. <clears throat> in, uh, in the past two years, we organized three learning cycles for uh, for our learning program and uh, they took place uh, either online either in person depending how uh, how we were uh, allowed uh, to by the external uh, um, environment uh, situation and we were able to uh, to gather together 98 participants from 21 countries um, most of them representatives from local and regional authorities and energy agencies, but also we uh, we had as participants uh, uh, representatives of uh, universities and uh, other topic connected organizations. And all the participants in uh, in the learning uh, program they uh, they um, developed an action plan for the region. They indicated uh, what. 100% uh, satisfaction rate for uh, for the program and 83% of them strongly agreed that they will be able to to apply the knowledge and information that they gained in uh, in this course. <clears throat> Today you are uh, attending a 3 hours crash course on uh, indicators for adaptation to climate change. 
Um, all these crash courses delivered in the month of May represent the compressed version of uh, the courses developed through the uh, Energy Watch Learning uh, program. And as the project is ending this summer, this is the last learning opportunity that uh, the program is offering. And from this summer on, uh, on the Energy Watch website, you will be able to find uh, um, multiple learning materials and best practices that will continue to uh, to support you, to support uh, uh, authorities and energy and climate agencies. Uh, for those that uh, participated uh, in uh, all these uh, four crash courses, um, you have the opportunity to uh, to ask us for uh, for a certificate of uh, of participation of completion completion of this uh, of this uh, learning uh, program. Uh, therefore, I invite everybody to uh, to be active, to uh, participate during uh, discussions, to ask questions, to ensure that uh, you can uh, benefit you and and the other participants can benefit the most out of this. Uh, learning opportunity. Uh, thank you very much. Welcome to Energy Watch. And uh, I will let uh, Sandra and uh, Francisca um, start the course. Thank you. Thank you, Sabina. Uh, so uh, just a few minutes, uh, I share the presentation. Um, is it OK? Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so, um, before we start, some uh, uh, we present you some preliminary uh, information. Uh, you can uh, contribute and uh, ask a question uh, in uh, in the conversation uh, section. Uh, the presentation will be uh, sent to you uh, later. Uh, don't forget to uh, turn off the microphones and uh, camera during the presentation. And uh, the webinar is a uh, recording for uh, for a replay. Um, regarding the uh, agenda, uh, the different uh, sequences uh, respect the different steps of an adaptation process, uh, an adaptation strategy. Uh, we will have uh, um, a 10 minutes break uh, in the morning and uh, we expect two feedbacks, one in concerning the city of Paris and uh, the other uh, Portuguese local authority. Um, the introduction um, uh, allows, allows us to present you some, uh, uh, f to say a few words about Energy Watch, but um, um, Sabina have, uh, has already uh, done uh, this uh, this uh, presentation, so uh, I go on on this uh, on this uh, presentation. Uh, just uh, a few words regarding the adaptation uh, module. Uh, regarding this uh, this uh, module, uh, we pay uh, attention to treat the question on data, but also to share uh, notions and uh, concepts and vocabulary. And finally, the same vision of what is adaptation regards the framework of IPCC. Uh, for us, it's very important to uh, share this uh, element before we can talk about uh, uh, data and uh, indicators. We will do uh, both the same. Uh, uh, the, the, we will discuss about this, uh, these elements. Who is participating today? Uh, this uh, illustration reflects how many participants of each part of the world are attending today, and uh, not only uh, European uh, area. So uh, welcome to this uh, to this uh, webinar. And um, and uh, we would like uh, to do some. Um, um, interactive question. Um, we we present you some uh, illustration. You can see uh, eight uh, pictures, and uh, we propose you to select one, uh, which represent for you uh, your view of the adaptation uh, today. Uh, to select uh, one picture, Francisca send you uh, a poll by uh, Teams uh, in the conversation, and uh, you can uh, so uh, select one picture that uh, for you it's the most representative of uh, adaptation today for you. 
Okay, so now you have the possibility over the uh, conversation tool. I see that some people have started to answer. You can just uh, select uh, your answer. We'll just wait for like 30 seconds to uh, give people a possibility to answer. So just to let you know, Sandra, for right now, uh, the picture which has the most uh, votes is number three. So I guess more about uh, maybe teamwork working together. <laughs> um, and uh, there's also the number six, uh, which uh, which has a lot of votes. So I would say, yeah, it's between. Uh... Ah, yes, now there are a few more votes coming in. So there's the seven and eight as well. So eight, I guess, uh, the, the toolkit. <laughs> which will be uh, also one of the topics today, <laughs> trying to show you some of the tools that uh, that you can access to to work on this. And uh, OK, great. Yeah, so I think the uh, really the, the pictures that got the most votes are the number three, the number six, number seven, number eight. Uh, so I guess, yeah, the notion of, of, of teamwork, of a challenge maybe as well, because uh, jumping out of an airplane isn't necessarily always the, the easiest thing to do. And of course, um, the con the idea of time and that maybe that we are slowly running out of time as well to act and so that we will have to act fast uh, in order to to have an impact. So, yeah, thank you very much, everybody, for, for participating in, in this little exercise. Thank you, Francesca. Uh, thank you to uh, to participate to this uh, interactive exercise. So now we can uh, we can start uh, this uh, learning course. And the first uh, sequence uh, is about the fundamentals of climate change uh, adaptation. And um, we um, we would like uh, to share uh, uh, some slides uh, representing the markers of uh, climate change. Uh, representing the main message about this uh, climate change. First of all, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions continue to uh, increase and uh, we uh, observe an uh, intensification of emission accumulation in the uh, atmosphere. Uh, this is a structural problem regarding the latency time of the uh, greenhouse uh, gas. The uh, IPCC uh, report explains the consequences of the increase of this uh, greenhouse gas. The scientists uh, note a global average temperature increase of 1.1 degree since the second half of the 19th century. Um, they organize five uh, scenarios in order uh, to link uh, the volume of the concentration of this uh, greenhouse gas with the level of the global um, average temperature and the uh, incurred impacts. To detail uh, these uh, incurred impacts, the scientists organize five groups of reason for concerns. In the worst uh, scenario, the, the 8.5, the extreme uh, events could be more uh, important and more uh, frequent. We can uh, observe uh, inside the range uh, of the objective of Paris uh, Agreement, 1.5 degree and 2 uh, degree, uh, that the impacts could be different in their intensity even in this uh, range of the uh, objectives. That's why each additional uh, fraction of uh, warming counts. And that's why the climate stakes requires articulated answers, mitigation and uh, adaptation solutions. 
the level of the ambition of uh, mitigation ans answers can condition uh, the needs uh, of uh, adaptation for uh, uh, the territories. Um, what uh, the scientists observe uh, also, it's uh, approximately 3.3 to 3.6 billion people uh, already live in contexts that are highly vulnerable to the consequences of climate change. And this uh, vulnerability uh, results from an overlap of challenges, including highly climate sensitive livelihoods, high levels uh, of poverty, lack of financing and accountability, lack of access to basic services and infrastructure like health, sanitation and water. Global warming has already uh, caused damage to ecosystem and some of it uh, are irreversible. Um, the intensification of warm extremes is causing tree mortality, forest debug and the degradation of warm water corals. This damage is aggravated by no climatic factors as pollution, artificialization and over exploitation. The scientists of IPCC develop interactive maps and it's very in, in, um, a good, uh, uh, interesting illustration to understand what happened in this uh, with the climate change. These maps represent different uh, climate parameters like hot extreme or agricultural draw or EV precip precipitation and confirm the human contribution on their occurrence. We see some elements regarding uh, the observation regarding the past. Now in the future, uh, the scientists uh, note that all regions are expecting to uh, experience change in at least five climatic impact drivers. These impact uh, driver in drivers are representing on the right on this slide. Uh, for example, you have the extreme heat, uh, mean precipitation, uh, fire weather, and uh, so on. We can wonder on the capacities of a region, a territory, to cope with this event, especially when they occur simultaneous. For example, a draw and um, and heat wave. So this is uh, some uh, projections. Uh, for uh, for uh, all territories. The scientists defined a fundamental notion. Uh, this is the key risk, the key climate risk. Um, this uh, key risk uh, represents an interaction between climate uh, relative hazard with the exposure and vulnerability of the affected human or ecological system. For Europe, the scientists define four key risks due to heat, uh, draw, uh, water scarcity, and uh, flooding and sea level rise. Um, this is an important uh, message uh, in uh, right in this uh, in this uh, slide uh, we say that the climate uh, stake requires articulating answers mitigation and adaptation because we have to stay within the limits of uh, capacity to cope with this accelerating pace of climate change for example uh, the nature based solution are important answers to adaptation and also mitigation but the ecosystem services depend on the good health of this ecosystem now vulnerable vulnerable with this uh, climate change and an example uh, for uh, the france uh, a global warming um, equivalent to 2 uh, degree 2.3 degree um, correspond to a temperature increase of 3.5 uh, degree so the change could be very, uh, the amplitude could be very different uh, 
uh, between uh, between uh, territories and uh, region. Now um, we suggest you to uh, to share some slide about the concept and the notion of uh, adaptation. The adaptation is uh, defined as a process of adjustment to actual or expected uh, climate and its effects. A key word uh, is process. Uh, we need different steps to develop an adaptation strategy. It takes time. Uh, we, um, and uh, another key word is adjustment. The adaptation, adaptation aims a change, but uh, you can consider different intensity of change, an incremental and a, or a transformational uh, adaptation. Um, to understand, to better understand this, uh, to grasp, uh, to grasp this uh, notion, uh, we present to you an uh, illustration in uh, agriculture. Uh, the incremental adaptation, or uh, adaptation actions, where the central aim is to maintain the essence and um, integrity of a system or process at a given scale. In, agric in agriculture. The incremental adaptation will not change uh, practices or crops. The action will concern, for example, uh, the uh, sowing date. The transformational adaptation is adaptation that changes the fundamental attributes of a system uh, in response to climate change and uh, its effects. And uh, for example, in agriculture, we will see uh, new production or uh, relocalization. Considering the trends of the climate change, uh, the scientists um, um, emphasize, emphasize uh, the need of uh, transformational uh, adaptation and we need to prepare it. Um, regarding the adaptation, uh, we consider that, uh, that we could be Adaptation could be characterized by three main notions. Uh, the notion of territory, the notion of adaptive management, and the notion of holistic and systematic approach. Um, this notion impacts decision process, public policies, stakeholder involving, and uh, values uh, sharing. Regarding the notion of territory, uh, the development of uh, solutions need to be as close as possible to the social, socio-economic specificities of the territories where the stake lie. The notion of territory reflects the notion of competence linked to the organization and local authorities where the actions are legitimate. At the level of the local authority, you have a better understanding of stakeholders and actors interaction and you need these uh, elements to establish a strategy and uh, uh, an action plan. Um, this is an illustration of the skills linked to different scales. And the uh, supra scale uh, can be considered as the scale where strategy, uh, thinking, mobilization of financial means and financial uh, circuits are organized. The local level is considered the most appropriate for uh, action because at the local scales, uh, public policies cover a wide range of themes, uh, subjects which are linked to adaptation. The issues are the articulation of these different scales uh, regarding the rhythm, the temporality, uh, the need uh, to coordination between elected officials, uh, maybe the rivalry between uh, territories. We can see that adaptation is also a question of attractivity of the uh, territory. The second notion is about adaptive uh, management. Uh, finally, um, because with the adaptation, we you have to manage uncertainty. Um, the uncertainty could be uh, related to the global climate change scenario. Uh, are we to uh, two degree or four degree increase? Uh, 
we don't know. Um, the responses of major cycles, ecosystem, and uh, societies uh, are also component of uh, uncertainty regarding their uh, uh, changes, the, um, this uh, evolution. So um, to cope with this uh, uncertainty, uh, we need to uh, adapt, uh, uh, adopt adaptive management in order to uh, adjust approaches in response to this uh, observation. Uh, that means that uh, public policies have to integrate this new um, uh, way to uh, manage or conduct uh, a, a project. Uh, as we see, is not uh, um, um, easy uh, for uh, to change uh, the way we can uh, conduct uh, this uh, the, the project. Um, the last uh, notion we would like to share with you is the notion of uh, holistic and uh, systemic approach. Um, the adaptation cover many domains at different scales, uh, governance, infrastructure, environment planning, health and water. And the adaptation uh, strategy need to integrate this global vision in order to optimize the solutions. Moreover, some uh, climatic impacts emphasize interdependencies, for example, between the energy network and the uh, transport. The question of holistic and systematic approach allows us to introduce the question of uh, maladaptation and uh, Francisca uh, takes the lead for the, the next of the presentation. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Sandra. So I think um, it uh, seemed important for us to um, yeah, talk a little bit about the, the concept of maladaptation um, because it is um, yeah, really uh, one of the big risks uh, in uh, an adaptation strategy that basically we see that measures uh, that were initially taken to have um, a beneficial uh, effects uh, to better adapt the territory to uh, the effects of climate change can also have some uh, negative uh, direct or indirect impacts which are have not were not necessarily taken into account uh, when the strategy was um, was being developed. So this is something quite important to uh, have in mind when uh, you are starting to work uh, on these topics. Uh, so maybe to come back to um, the definition that is given of maladaptation by the IPCC. Um, uh, this is all kinds of um, measures uh, that uh, uh, have a risk of increasing um, adverse climate related consequences. Uh, and so um, that can uh, concern um, different types of problems. So um, on the one hand to um, have a negative impact on uh, mitigation uh, of climate change. So instead of reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions might uh, increase greenhouse uh, gas emissions, which could be the case, for example, for very uh, carbon intensive infrastructures, which may actually uh, yeah, have a negative impact on um, um, uh, on the, the greenhouse gas emissions of the of the territory. Uh, it is also um, uh, the fact of uh, increasing or displacing uh, the vulner vulnerability to climate change, so to maybe reducing the vulnerability vulnerability on one territory but increasing it on another or um, uh, decreasing it uh, for a short period of time, but then in the long term uh, still uh, uh, increasing uh, the uh, vulnerability of, of, of the territory. Um, and then there is also a socioeconomic um, dimension to this, which is basically to make sure that the measures that are taken will not result in more uh, inequitable outcomes uh, for the population, so that they do not um, increase socioeconomic inequalities, for example, that that are already present on on the uh, on the territory. And so, which is uh, quite important, I think, is that um, we also see that most of the times maladaptation is an unintended consequence. So, so like I said, it is a result of actions uh, that were um, initially uh, planned to help and to have positive impacts, uh, and which did not uh, work out as as planned. Um, and so we see here that there are uh, different types of um, of maladaptation that maybe we can um, 
um, split in three different categories, um, uh, with some of them being really uh, more top-down approaches, so that there is a um, a plan, uh, planned actions that are um, developed by um, uh, a public authority, uh, and then on the other hand, you also have a more um, bottom-up approach, uh, one could say, with uh, more spontaneous uh, reactions that are taken by the population in absence, most of the time, of uh, actions implemented by uh, the public authority. Uh, so here you have the examples of uh, uh, infrastructural maladaptation, which is basically this idea of cre um, creating um, important, often uh, grey types of infrastructure, such as seawalls, uh, which will protect from certain risks, such as the uh, sea level rises, um, but which can also um, either be um, badly planned, so that they are not adapted to uh, the actual risks uh, that the territory is facing, um, and can also have a, a negative impact on, on giving a false sense of security, so that uh, development will continue um, in, uh, in a certain territory, and then at some point uh, when the uh, amplitude of the changes uh, get more and more important, uh, the, the infrastructure may then uh, break, and then a lot of people uh, will be very impacted uh, from this. Uh, it's a similar concept with the example that we give for institutional adaptation. Uh, so the fact of, again, uh, kind of maintaining um, an activity, uh, which is very, um, uh, which is very vulnerable uh, to climate risks through financial compensation, for example, how uh, like you can have come some kind of climate insurances for agriculture, for housing, and which will uh, finally slow uh, more transformational changes uh, that would uh, help make the um, the agricultural activities, for example, more uh, more resilient uh, to uh, to the climate changes. And then finally, uh, the last example uh, that we wanted to give you was more on uh, so more spontaneous with a behavioral maladaptation, um, with uh, I guess the most um, uh, common example will be that of. Um, of air conditioning, so that uh, when heat waves get uh, more and more frequent, well, more and more people will spontaneously um, install uh, air conditioning in uh, their houses, and which will then again have a, a negative effect both on greenhouse gas emissions as well as on um, as on urban heat. Uh, but uh, we can think of other examples, for example, types of spontaneous migrations um, away from areas affected by climate change or also uh, a change in, in, in the crops that are, are cultivated, which uh, could potentially have uh, negative impacts if uh, there's not any um, planning around uh, these changes, which will result in, in, uh, in people, for example, in agriculture, uh, losing um, income. Uh, because of these very um, more chaotic, uh, spontaneous transformations, which are which are taken in reaction to uh, to the increased climate pressure, and so uh, next slide, please, uh, Sandra. Thank you. Um, and so basically, um, uh, when we take these different examples, we can see that uh, different types of uh, adaptation actions uh, will carry a different uh, degree of risk uh, for a maladaptive um, maladaptive outcome. Uh, and so more uh, kind of what we would say more soft actions, which are more about raising awareness, capacity building, uh, improving um, uh, processes and, and planning. Uh, those are typically more or less these kind of win-win actions, uh, which have a very low risk of uh, negative outcomes because uh, in general they can be um, uh, applied and implemented in, in a very equitable fashion. They do not uh, need a lot of uh, means. They're not emissions uh, intensive. Um, and so these are, are actions which are relatively easy uh, to, uh, to be implemented. Uh, and then we, uh, we have actions which um, aim at a decreasing sensitivity. So then again, through um, infrastructure, um, or through changes in development plans, et cetera, et cetera, or even decreasing exposure. So going right up to even resettling entire communities. Uh, there, uh, we will have uh, a bigger risk of uh, maladaptive outcomes because often these actions are very um, uh, greenhouse gas uh, emission intensive. Um, they are very costly, and uh, they will often have uh, negative socioeconomic impacts on uh, the populations which are concerned. Um, 
Now, this doesn't mean, uh, of course, uh, that the only adaptation actions that we should take are these kind of soft um, actions uh, aiming at increasing adaptive capacity. Um, on the contrary, often reducing exposure to climate risks uh, will be an unavoidable measure in the medium or long term uh, in order to go towards the kind of transformative adaptation uh, of the territory, as uh, Sandra presented it um, just before. Uh, but it's just to uh, to show that these are um, a kind of high risk actions. Uh, and so the, the risks have to be anticipated in the planning phase in order to limit, uh, try to identify the potential and desirable effects and to, to limit them accordingly. Um, and yeah, to finish on this concept, maybe just the, the next slide. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, basically this diagram is um, uh, just to show you that often we are not on, uh, it's not black and white with this, um, but it's usually a, a range between um, are we um, in a spectrum of maladaptation or an effective adaptation It is often not so easy uh, to to say where exactly you are situated on this range. Um, which is also uh, linked to the difficulty of evaluating uh, the actual effects uh, that the adaptation measures are having. And so often it will be something more in the middle that um, maybe some of the, the measures taken will have some positive um, effects that were originally planned, but will also have some negative um, effects that were not anticipated before. Uh, and so we will uh, present you afterwards um, what are the different uh, things to have in mind when evaluating uh, an adaptation strategy in order to try to limit uh, these risks of, of maladaptation. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Francisca, for uh, the part of uh, the presentation regarding uh, adaptation. Uh, we would like to see uh, another uh, uh, concept uh, we would like to share with you. It's about the assessment and um, Francisca uh, will uh, present you the fundamentals regarding assessment and the link uh, with uh, adaptation. Thank you. Um, yes, so um, basically, uh, I mean, uh, an adaptation uh, policy or, or strategy is uh, um, more more or less like any kind of uh, uh, of public policy. Um, usually goes through um, a process from uh, the uh, initial planning, the action plan, and finally ends in in an ev evaluation. Um, uh, so, uh, generally speaking, uh, public policy evaluation. Uh, has three um, main objectives. Uh, so uh, first of all, what we call here the cognitive approach, which is basically to generate uh, knowledge on uh, the public actions that have been taken. So uh, in the example of adaptation to climate change, uh, basically the objective of the evaluation, one of the objectives of this evaluation will be to understand what are the uh, real effects um, that have resulted from uh, the adaptive measures that uh, have been implemented. Um, then uh, it also has the objective of allowing the organization, but also the citizens uh, to understand the value of the measures that have been implemented. So this is uh, what we call the normative approach. Um, and so uh, to uh, be able to show if um, in fine, the adaptation measures have actually reduced or not the, vulnerab the vulnerability of the territory. So to what extent have we become more resilient uh, to uh, future climate risks? Uh, and then um, the third objective is more uh, set in an instrumental approach. So uh, basically, uh, what, how can we understand the effects of the uh, measures we have implemented in order to improve um, the measures that we will implement in the future. So how do we make them more effective? How do we make them more efficient? How do we make them more coherent with uh, the other um, policies that we are implementing in our territory? Um, and so this we will see in, in the context of climate change adaptation is very important to understand uh, what are the future actions that are necessary and uh, how do we construct them uh, on the basis of, of what has already been implemented. Um, so we thank you. Um, 
And uh, uh, in the context of, of adaptation to climate change, this process of evaluation is um, often the most difficult, the, the biggest challenge for uh, the local authority that are implementing an adaptation policy, um, but is also one of the most important uh, steps um, because um, today all types of uh, climate change adaptation strategies are developed under high degrees of uncertainty. Uh, because like uh, we saw it in the initial presentation from Sandra, today we don't know exactly uh, what the future um, impact of climate change will be. We don't know exactly the amplitude of certain changes, the way they will affect um, a given territory. Even if we have a, a, a global vision, we don't always know what the local impacts uh, will be. We don't always know how the different uh, actors and stakeholders uh, will react to these changes. Um, and so basically, uh, we have to um, uh, uh, gradually step up uh, the action that we are taking uh, as the more and more information becomes uh, available. Um, and so uh, the at each phase of the adaptation strategy, uh, it is important to see, OK, what are the actual impacts of uh, the measures that have been implemented and are these actions still relevant? Uh, given the changes that we are starting to see. For example, uh, if we um, take the example of sea level rise, if we see that um, there are um, the risk of flooding, for example, is increasing much faster than what we originally anticipated, then uh, this will also have an impact on the, on the degree and the amplitude of the actions that we'll have to take. Uh, and that, for example, certain uh, infrastructures that uh, were uh, built uh, based on the level of knowledge that we had before might no longer be relevant or will have to be stepped up or maybe more drastic measures will have to be taken to uh, adjust uh, to the actual changes that we uh, will see. Uh, and uh, in um, link to what we have seen before, evaluation is also crucial to identify uh, the risk of maladaptation, so basically to catch it before it happens, um, as it is said here, uh, and basically to make sure that uh, the measures implemented don't have uh, any kind of negative um, uh, indirect impacts on uh, different sectors such as mitigation, such as um, uh, socioeconomic well-being, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that are directly or indirectly uh, connected to, uh, to the issue uh, of adaptation. Uh, and so uh, we see also in, in the literature that um, this uh, evaluation and the understanding of whether or not uh, a given strategy or action has been um, effective or has been uh, a success is often very difficult um, to evaluate, uh, given that often the actions will um, have uh, will touch on lots of different um, sectors, lots of different uh, themes, so biodiversity, health, urban planning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so it is often uh, very difficult to have all of the information to uh, be able to have a complete um, uh, impact assessment. So uh, next slide, uh, please. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, so just we wanted to clear up. So um, uh, basically you have do two different uh, phases. So you have the uh, monitoring of the actions um, and then you have the evaluation at the usually at the end of the of the phase. Uh, so the monitoring really um, aims at observing how um, the policy is being implemented. Um, and so you will collect information regularly to uh, uh, analyze what the progress and the results uh, of uh, the action implemented are. Um, and so it is usually an internal uh, exercise uh, inside of the organization which is implementing uh, the policy to uh, be able to, um, um, yeah, to analyze uh, internally the, the progress that you're making, the means that are, that are being affected, et cetera, et cetera. Um, while well, evaluation will really be um, um, not just to analyze the progress that is being made, but really um, think about um, uh, how you can improve a future uh, policy programming on the basis of the effect that we have uh, uh, observed. Um, and uh, so it is also difficult sometimes to find the uh, direct, uh, to point the direct causality between uh, some of the actions that have been implemented and the actual effects that uh, we are observing on the territory. So this is one of the main challenges also of, of evaluation. And so it is a much more um, episodic uh, process, uh, which will usually um, be uh, conducted at the end of a program uh, or after um, the end of the implementation of, uh, of a policy and uh, before 
starting uh, the development and the planning of uh, the new strategy. Uh, and uh, what is very important to us is that the evaluation um, exercise uh, cannot be internal. It has to be participative, par participative and it has to involve a lot of uh, external stakeholders and even the citizens of the territory in order to make sure uh, that, like we said, to really understand all of these different direct and indirect impacts of the actions uh, that are implemented and also to um, better understand what the future action uh, that will have to be taken uh, can be based on the actual needs uh, of the different stakeholders. And so we have a concrete example for you on the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so we just wanted to show you uh, the example of, uh, of um, a logic impact diagram uh, to uh, illustrate kind of these, uh, what are the different indicators or goals set for monitoring on the one side and evaluation on the others. And um, the example that we chose is uh, the, um, the transformation and um, renovation of schoolyards, uh, which is um, a, a big issue in the Île-de-France region because we see that a lot of the schoolyards traditionally are very uh, mineral, uh, there's a lot of concrete, there's not a lot of trees, not a lot of vegetation. So uh, in summer, when there is a heat wave, but these are typically uh, places where the heat accumulates uh, very strongly, and which then has a lot of negative uh, health impacts, both on, uh, on, on the children, on the staff, uh, etc., and the different people uh, in the school. So um, here the example given is uh, an action plan to uh, transform uh, and have more vegetation in uh, in the schoolyards. And uh, so you can see that in uh, on the part of monitoring, the indicators that you will see is like concretely what are the actions um, that we are implementing. So what is the number of uh, schoolyards that we are renovating and what are the means also the uh, budget that we are dedicating to uh, this action. And so for every indicator, we also have uh, an associated goal. So what uh, are we aiming at? Uh, what is the objective that we are fixing for ourselves? Um, and then uh, we see that the, um, uh, in the evaluation process, it's much more about uh, the actual um, impacts that the implemented actions uh, will have. So concretely, okay, we have renovated uh, maybe five different school years, but what are the impact that this has on temperature during heat waves? Uh, does this actually have a, a positive impact on um on sick days, so does it have positive health benefits for uh, the the students and for the staff in the schools? And uh, are there maybe some indirect effects uh, that we could imagine? So, for example, here about uh, raising awareness about the issues of of greening of urban heat, etc., and how's this um, felt by uh, the people that are concerned? So, this is just to give you an example of the different indicators that are associated to the monitoring and to the evaluation phases. And uh, so, we can go to the next slide. Yes, thank you. Um, and um, so uh, basically here, just a few more concrete examples um, for uh, the assessment and monitoring of an adaptation policy. Uh, so first of all, what scope uh, you have selected? Are we on the level of uh, one concrete action or one project? Uh, is it about uh, the adaptation strategy in its whole or um, are we in a more a global, sustainable territorial approach, which will uh, treat both uh, the issues of adaptation and mitigation at the same time? And so how do we specifically monitor the actions which are dedicated to uh, adaptation in this more um, global approach? Uh, and so um, what we said uh, before, there's a, a lot, a list of basically different evaluation questions. Um, which will help us appreciate basically the progress uh, that is made uh, to understand uh, whether the actions implemented are effective. Um, and uh, in the end, always the, the most important questions is to uh, be able to assess how the level of vulnerability has evolved. Um, and so there, there's a, a, um, a real challenge uh, because uh, this will uh, necessitate uh, the fact of having a lot of different indicators to look at. So about the um, uh, so so concretely how the different sectors, uh, tourism, health, uh, housing, urban planning, uh, biodiversity, etc., how uh, um, they react to the action implemented and whether they have become more or, or less vulnerable. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, 
And what uh, another thing which is uh, very important um, is basically to also assess um, uh, the adaptive capacity uh, of uh, the, your organization. Uh, so basically, on the one hand, um, do we have all of the uh, knowledge and information that can be available as to take um, coherent and effective decisions? Or do we actually have to start by uh, gathering data or uh, doing specific studies on certain sectors, for example, forest or agriculture, to better understand actually the risks and the vulnerabilities that these sectors are facing? But also, do we actually have the financial and the human means uh, that are necessary in order to take um, to carry out the adaptation uh, strategy that we would like to fix. Um, and of course, this will have a very big impact on uh, the efficiency of uh, the adaptation measures that will be taken. Uh, and finally, uh, we wanted to um, insist on uh, the links between uh, mitigation and adaptation. Uh, and I think we can uh, go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, because it's, uh, uh, like we said, very, very important to articulate uh, these two issues. Often uh, we see that uh, they're both treated uh, in a same strategy or same action plan. So you will have some actions related to mitigation, others to adaptation. Uh, and often the majority of the action plan will be uh, more dedicated to mitigation rather than uh, adaptation. Uh, and so it's, it's really important to um, make sure uh, that none of the adaptation actions are having a negative effect on mitigation and uh, vice versa. Um, and uh, in order to uh, really track uh, the actual effects of uh, the adaptation measures, uh, there's basically a decision that you um, have to make when you have this kind of integrated action plan, which is basically do you evaluate uh, the measures re related to adaptation separately from mitigation or do you uh, evaluate both of them together? Um, and so there's not necessarily a, a right or wrong answer, um, but there are certain things uh, to, to have in mind. So on the one hand, um, uh, there's a case to make for evaluating adaptation separately because we see that today there's really a lack of awareness on these issues in many local authorities that is not treated in the same way as, as the issue of mitigation. Um, and so this can also increase uh, basically the visibility of uh, the adaptation policy, but it also has the risk of not identifying negative impacts that these measures could have on greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, often there will not necessarily be a choice uh, because we only have limited um, financial or human means uh, dedicated to the evaluation process. Uh, and so then often the decision will be to carry out the, the process together to save, uh, um, to save costs. But then this will have the, the risk of including certain indicators of stakeholders which are specific to adaptation uh, and which are not integrated in, into mitigation. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, and you just have a, on the next slide a, a small um, overview of uh, the differences. And so uh, really the, the one uh, I think we would like to emphasize this is really the, the difference that on mitigation, it is much easier in a certain way because you have one universal indicator, which is the evolution of greenhouse gas emissions, which you can track. And in adaptation, it will be much more complicated due to the fact that you have a combination of indicators and that some of these indicators may only be valid for a limited time uh, as uh, impacts of climate change uh, evolve and progress. And uh, I think the next should be the uh, the last slide. Yes, so just um, as a conclusion, uh, this is uh, a methodology um, to evaluate um, the, the adaptive capacity of your organization, which has been, de been developed by uh, IDRI, uh, and yeah, which we would um, encourage you to, uh, to have a look out at. And uh, it basically gives the, um, a bit uh, an overview of the different evaluative uh, questions uh, that you can have in order to uh, evaluate your um, uh, adaptation uh, policy. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Francisca. Uh, so uh, you you have a concentrated overview of the fundamentals about adaptation and uh, about uh, 
um, the uh, evaluation, the monitoring, and uh, for us it was very important to uh, share with you this uh, uh, few uh, slides uh, to have the same uh, vision and the same uh, vocabulary about uh, adaptation and about assessment uh, because uh, we need some data, but uh, why we need uh, this data and uh, for uh, for um, for what kind of uh, works and for what kind of uh, exercise. So um, now we can uh, go on with the presentation. And um, in this uh, sequence, uh, we will see some uh, methods and uh, elements to uh, establish a diagnosis. Um, in, this is the first step uh, of an adaptation process. And uh, at uh, this stage, uh, you will have done some uh, preliminary works, uh, for example, to identify existing strategies in uh, the territory, uh, to understand the motivation of the adaptation process, uh, to uh, define uh, the team, the mobilize, mobilize the team, the pilot of this uh, uh, adaptation process. And uh, it's also uh, at this stage, uh, you begin a reflection about the data uh, to consider uh, in, uh, in this, in this uh, process. Um, an important um, point uh, we would like to share uh, again is the notion of the vision. Uh, why your uh, local authority, uh, your organization engage uh, this uh, process? Uh, for us, it's not only a question of rule or logo, legal obligation. Uh, for example, some uh, economic aspects or the aim to be uh, the safest city in the world as uh, Los Angeles illustrate this uh, politic uh, vision of adaptation. So um, to uh, establish the diagnosis, uh, also called vulnerability uh, assessment, uh, we need to consider uh, three components. Um, uh, the combination uh, of, the, of the hazard, uh, the exposure sensitivity and the adaptative, adaptive capacity determine a level of vulnerability. With the diagnosis, uh, you can understand the main stakes now in the future for your uh, territory. In more detail, uh, the uh, hazard will uh, refer to uh, climatic parameters and uh, induced phenomena such as uh, draw or flooding by runoff. We'll talk about physical data. Hazard uh, can refer to extreme parameters such uh, intense uh, rainfall or climatic uh, trend hazard such as the decrease in frost frequency. The use of the cartography is a way to represent the hazard data. In this uh, illustration, uh, Institut Paris Région for the needs of a territorial uh, diagnosis represent the number of the heat wave days at different time horizons and according to the scenario considered. We can see uh, the trend and the amplitude of the number of heat wave days. Um, here you have the observation uh, in the past and you can see the range between 6 and 10 um, days of uh, heat wave. And if we are in the worst uh, scenario, uh, you can see uh, the uh, trend and the amplitude of this uh, number uh, regarding the time uh, horizon. And so you can see that we um, we can reach uh, 30 days uh, of uh, heat waves and uh, and moreover in the in uh, long long term. The question uh, is to understand how the hazard uh, affect the territory and the level of sensitivity. Uh, for example, when we talk about heat waves, we can imagine that an urban territory will be particularly affected capturing this heat. 
health impacts are expected, especially for part of the population, uh, the youngest and uh, the eldest, but not only. The sensitivity of a territory will be more or less high regarding this uh, proportion. Other factors need to be considered in order to understand how the people, the ter territory cope with the risk. Uh, for example, regarding the level of uh, income, uh, the health care offer and so on. To analyze the exposure and sensitivity, we need multiple socioeconomic uh, data and we have to cross uh, this, this data to understand uh, this uh, sensitivity uh, of the territory. Some information characterize uh, the level of sensitivity of the territory. This slide sums up several questions helping to organize this information. For example, uh, what facilities have been damaged, uh, destroyed by the climate hazard? Um, uh, did the climate hazard create economic losses uh, and and uh, and other examples? Um, maybe you 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 may need to collect information and uh, conduct a surveys, uh, asking a stakeholders territory to collect this uh, this information and to help you to establish this uh, this uh, diagnosis. Um, we we can use also cartographic tool to represent this uh, sensitivity. Um, um, in this case, uh, this uh, cartography uh, established by uh, Institut uh, Paris Region uh, represents the flood impacts of the Seine River in the city of Genevilliers near Paris. Um, in blue, uh, you can see uh, infrastructure and uh, buildings directly concerned by the flood. But we can, so, um, we can see also in red, fragile uh, area of energy uh, networks, uh, which uh, concern the area, area not directly concerned by the, uh, the flood, but uh, they, um, they uh, expect some impacts regarding dysfunctionment of, uh, for example, transfer from uh, energy uh, and so on. So we can see a large area concerned by the flood, not only uh, the area uh, directly in the um, uh, in the indirectly damaged by the by the water. Um, the third component will uh, concern the adaptive uh, capacity. Uh, the aim is to uh, identify some uh, policies measures financial means available, which could moderate the uh, climate uh, impacts. So the articulation of the three components will uh, help you to determine the level of vulnerability. The challenge is to collect a large range of data. Furthermore, you will need some projection in order to analyze the future vulnerabilities. The level of vulnerability is not an absolute, absolute value. Uh, you need to involve all stakeholders for a shared vision of the issues. Uh, not of all will have the same uh, perceptions. In most cases, uh, the diagnosis can be established by using different classes of ponderation, for example, uh, high, low, uh, medium. Uh, and we can see an example with the city of uh, Belgrade. In the beginning, uh, you have to consider a referential matrix in order to uh, classify your uh, results. And uh, this is uh, the example of the city of Belgrade and the uh, decline this uh, matrix for um, the theme of population and uh, infrastructure. And uh, they can uh, establish for each uh, component uh, what, what are the level of their uh, sensitivity and uh, vulnerability regarding different parametric uh, uh, climate parameters. 
one of the difficulty is to cross several data in order to get this vision of uh, vulnerability. Um, in this uh, in this uh, slide, uh, you, you you have a view of some uh, data used to uh, establish this uh, this diagnosis. For the need of the learning course, uh, we have uh, established a benchmark of the most common indicator used for each component. Um, you can uh, uh, visualize some extract of these two works, so for example, for data. For hazard, you have data about the number of summon days, uh, of heat wave days. Uh, for exposure, uh, you can interest about the share of the population age over 65, uh, about the disruption of public services, number of the day, um, monitoring of phenology, the flooring dates and uh, and so on and for adaptive capacity uh, you can uh, for example um, collect information about the greening rate of uh, of the of the cities um, if uh, uh, if we have a synthetic uh, view of indicators uh, it's necessary to understand in which way we can uh, obtain uh, the data uh, some of them uh, are available inside your own organization, but others need to be collected from variety of actors, uh, for example, observatories, um, forest and nature agency, uh, uh, water agencies, health observatory, uh, insurance field, and um, maybe uh, you have to uh, search alternative solutions uh, if you don't uh, get this information uh, uh, on your territory. Uh, for example, find data from a higher territorial scale, uh, observatory and on national or European scale. And that's why we suggest you also to refer to a climate, uh, climate adapt. It's uh, important also to um, um, to um, rely on about the knowledge, uh, the feedback of the uh, actors of your uh, territory. And so uh, we are. Uh, we sorry, sorry, Sandra, just maybe to uh, uh, complete before we, we go to break, uh, just maybe to um, go back to the last slide you showed about the sources uh, of data. So there was a question um, from, from the participants about basically some resources with um, examples of indicators that can be used for, for different measures. So uh, I know this was kind of what you were talking about. So maybe the things that you would... Um, uh, recommend is especially the climate adapt platform where there's a lot of information available. I don't know if you if you would like to, yeah, maybe just uh, complete on that on yeah where you can find resources to help uh, uh, define different indicators on on different sectors, etc. Yes, uh, um, in fact, uh, one the the difficulty it's uh, about the collect of the data and maybe you can uh, you can uh, they are not available at the level of your territory and most of the time we uh, we suggest to uh, refer to the uh, uh, higher um, uh, higher scale of uh, territory and uh, for example in Europe we have the opportunity uh, to um, to get information uh, with uh, climate uh, adapt, uh, but you can also have some information with uh, IPCC. Uh, it's it's true that it's a, a macro um, a level, but it can give you some uh, trend uh, about the um, uh, the. Uh, parameter cl climate, for example, or they can give you some information uh, about uh, economic and uh, social uh, elements for your, uh, uh, for your territory. Uh, it's difficult because we say that uh, adaptation is a question of uh, uh, local scale, but it's not uh, always uh, easy uh, to get information about at uh, this uh, level. Um, another uh, maybe advice is to um, 
uh, to create a, um, a community uh, with uh, the stakeholders uh, in order to uh, exchange uh, also the information uh, they have regarding their uh, activities, uh, regarding their uh, their missions. And uh, that's why it's important at the beginning on the process of adaptation to create this uh, community, um, to create the vision of adaptation and to understand what kind of information and data uh, you can uh, ex exchange each other in order to um, establish this uh, uh, vision of vulnerability of the territory. Uh, it's, um, a it's very complex, but um, um, maybe with the um, the um, support of these uh, stakeholders, you can uh, go on with the uh, with the uh, diagnosis. Um, maybe um, I think the most important is to have a view of the main stakes, uh, even if you don't have the the detail of the data. Uh, the most important is to start uh, to have a view of the main stakes, to understand the interdependencies, uh, also to have this uh, global uh, vision and to start uh, the work of uh, adaptation. And uh, uh, more and more you will uh, create also this uh, data when you uh, go on with this uh, adaptation process. And um, uh, another point I, I said uh, before, it's the uh, knowledge, the local knowledge. Uh, maybe you have to conduct uh, some uh, surveys uh, with the inhabitants, with the uh, stakeholders in order to uh, have their feedbacks and the, um, uh, some uh, elements and, um, and some data uh, to uh, help you for this, uh, for this uh, diagnosis. I don't know if I answer your question, but uh, I think it's the is the advice I will um, I will suggest. Uh, maybe as uh, there is another question in the conversation section. I don't see. Sorry. Um, no, it's okay. I we we have another. I don't know if you necessarily have, I, I know this is something that ah. we already discussed before. Okay. Uh, which is a bit basically about the, um, how to say, like how to um, argument the budget, the financial means that uh, you will put to uh, adaptation measures uh, and basically how to um, argue uh, for the, um, the benefits of uh, putting money into adaptation measures uh, comparing to uh, the measures that we, um, the budget that we will dedicate, for example, to mitigation. So maybe this whole aspect of uh, how to um, uh, justify the budget that you're spending for adaptation measures at the um, scale of a local authority. Uh, yes, uh, I think we will see this point in uh, when we will talk about uh, strategy and uh, action plan, but uh, the, I think the difficulty is not to oppose uh, mitigation and adaptation, and uh, this is what uh, happened at the beginning of the uh, international uh, negoti negoti negotiations uh, with the um, um, different. Um, um, how, how was I to say? Uh, for example, the uh, couple. Yes, sorry. Yes, uh, before when we start, uh, when they start the, um, to um, to cope with the climate change, uh, there is this uh, uh, idea to put all the efforts uh, for the uh, mitigation because we will have time to see uh, the effect and the uh, subject of adaptation. But in fact, uh, uh, they understand that uh, the, we have to consider the, um, this um, a global vision of the climate change mitigation and adaptation. And uh, maybe, maybe one answer is to uh, consider uh, action that they could have co-benefits uh, adaptation and mitigation or action that not um, are, are not maladaptation as uh, say uh, Francisca uh, will not uh, um, damage the, the, 
the, the, the action of uh, mitigation, for example. Uh, I think we have to consider the same. We have to consider the same uh, um, um, objective, the same uh, efforts uh, to mitigation and adaptation. We have. Uh, we need to. Um, to uh, attribute the same uh, ambitious in the uh, financial means in the two uh, in the two subjects um, if we want to succeed to cope with uh, the climate change now the for the adaptation we have to justify maybe um, more than uh, mitigation uh, some action but now we understand that uh, cost and damages uh, could be an argument uh, to justify uh, the uh, adaptation uh, strategy and the adaptation uh, uh, action. Uh, but we will see this point um, uh, later uh, during the, the presentation. And uh, if it's OK for uh, everyone, we, we can take uh, a, a break. Um, we can continue the presentation. I hope uh, everyone is OK and is uh, connected. Uh, now we will see uh, the part regarding the strategy and the uh, action plan. Um, Francesca will uh, uh, present you some um, some uh, uh, common elements and uh, methods regarding this uh, this part. Uh, so, um, I lay Thank you, Francisca. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so basically, uh, you can see here, so everything that we are presenting you to today is basically the following the process of how to uh, build up um, your adaptation strategy. So starting with what we have seen uh, earlier this morning, starting with uh, the vulnerability assessment of your territory, um, then uh, building up the strategic vision of adaptation on your territory. And so now uh, the next step is basically to concretely operationalize this uh, political or strategic vision. Uh, so concretely um, building an action plan. And uh, so uh, the uh, these all of these um, phases that have uh, come before uh, the development of the action plan uh, also uh, contribute uh, basically to identifying uh, the main priorities, the main needs, um, and this is um, specifically done through uh, the um, all of the co-construction work. Um, which is done before with the different uh, stakeholders and actors of the territory. So this is why it is very important that at every phase it is a, a participative uh, and open uh, process that allows a uh, lot of different actors to um, express their their needs, their priorities, their worries um, about uh, the issues of the of uh, the effect of, of climate change. And so the discussions uh, with uh, these different actors, on the one hand, the analysis of uh, different studies, uh, data, etc., on the other, uh, will already have um, uh, given you some material that will help you to um, uh, build up a first um, uh, list uh, uh, portfolio, basically, of different actions. Uh, that um, seem relevant to answer, uh, to, to give an answer to the different challenges that you have identified uh, for your territory in, in the assessment phase. Uh, so once you have this first um, portfolio of actions, we can uh, go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the idea is basically, okay, so how uh, do we organize uh, all of these different measures? How do we prioritize them? How do we better understand um, uh what um uh to what challenges they are connected and um uh and uh, also to to see which uh, of these actions finally we will actually keep in our action plan or not because often it is very difficult to do everything uh, if you have limited uh financial means uh, time etc to um to dedicate to uh to this program and so here we wanted to give you uh basically some examples uh, some um, examples of uh, methods of how you can uh, classify uh, your uh, initial uh, portfolio uh, of actions uh, by different uh, categories. So first of all, you can ask yourself what are uh, finally the stakes 
that these actions uh, relate to. So basically, um, do we want to um, implement measures uh, which will um, uh, have impact, positive impact on, on the health of vulnerable uh, populations? Do we want to increase uh, damages on, uh, on critical infrastructure? Do we want to address losses uh, that we are observing in agricultural sectors, et cetera, et cetera? So basically, concretely, what are the different um, stakes that we have identified in our vulnerability assessment and what are the measures that we can take to uh, address them? So uh, this is basically a, a first way of, of categorizing, which really relates to the exercise of the vulnerability assessment. Um, another method uh, that we suggest is uh, more basically by thematic categories, which often corresponds to the way that the organization or the local authority is uh, organized, because we will often have a, a sectoral um, uh, thematic organizations of departments, which are one department responsible for urban planning, another for mo mobility, another for the building sector. And so basically organizing your different measures uh, according to uh, this um, these thematic departments already helps to assign responsibility and to see uh, really which um, actors, uh, local officials, uh, technical agents and the local authority, etc., will be responsible for um, implementing and monitoring uh, these different measures. Uh, another approach is uh, a tip, um, the, the types of actions related to adaptation. So in general, we see that in, um, uh, in an adaptation strategy, we will have three different categories uh, of measures. Uh, so first of all, uh, the um, uh, what we call soft adaptation measures, uh, so which will be related to um, uh, to uh, capacity building, to improving the different uh, mapping and, and planning processes, for example, for urban planning, on to how to better articulate them with um, the challenges related to climate change, uh, how to better integrate uh, the issue of adaptation in uh, these strategies. Um, and then we have uh, the technical or gray solutions, uh, which are generally infrastructure based. So um, uh, basically the refurbishment of buildings, uh, examples such as um, physical flood defenses or also uh, infrastructure uh, related to uh, to sewage system, uh, the protection of critical infrastructures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so this is another uh, category. And then finally, we'll have the ecological or green um, uh, solutions. Um, which will be everything related to to uh, green infrastructure and especially nature-based solutions, um, which we will find in this. And so usually uh, the objective is uh, that in the portfolio you will not have of your actions and your action plan, you will not only have one type of action. So for example, only soft adaptation measures, but um, no uh, operational or infrastructure related uh, actions. But the idea is to have a mix um, between these uh, different categories uh, to kind of balance out the different actions that, that you will take um, in, in your plan. And uh, finally, again, related to the, the concept of adaptation, you can also question yourself uh, for each action. Is this a measure which um, uh, induces an incremental adaptation? So basically, which maintains the system um, uh, as it is, or are we um, uh, more uh, towards a transformational adaptation, uh, knowing that um, usually the, both of them will not necessarily be on the same uh, time scale. So incremental adaptation will be maybe more short term and transformational adaptation will often be, or at least the impacts uh, that we can observe will be more uh, long term. Uh, and finally, to also uh, see if uh, the measures that you're taking are um, actually um, aiming at uh, increasing the adaptate, uh, adaptive capacity of the organization, which will often be the case of a lot of soft adaptation measures, for example, or, uh, or is the um, objective of the measure to reduce the exposition or the sensitivity uh, of the territory or of a certain structure to um, uh, climate change impact, which will often be the case of, for example, more infrastructural uh, solutions. So uh, I think this is a good method to uh, classify and uh, then prioritize uh, the different um, actions that you have identified at the at the first stage. Um, 
so then we can uh, continue to the to the next slide. Yes, um, and so um, like we said, when we have to, um, uh, there will often be a, a difference between uh, the initial portfolio of actions that you drew up in the beginning with all of the different start stakeholders, which will often be very large, and then finally the um, prioritized uh, selection that will um, compose your action plan um, in the end. Uh, because we have to uh, look for every kind of action, what is actually uh, feasible uh, and what is also the budget that we uh, have that to dedicate to these different actions. And so uh, some of the uh, most like the three most important point to, 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 to look at is on the one hand, what is the um, temporality of the actions? So are these measures uh, something that I can implement uh, right away or all of the um, um, things that I need to implement this action already um, uh, there? Are the actors uh, mobilized, uh, aware of these issues and ready to help me in uh, implementing these actions? Um, or will I have to have some preparatory uh, phases? For example, first uh, do uh, some, um, some measures of uh, awareness raising in internally in the local authority to also make, for example, elected officials more aware of this to have a stronger political um, support for more um, costly or operational actions that I will only be able to implement later in the process. Um, and also, when will the impact of these actions actually uh, be observed? So are we uh, on actions that will have a very short term uh, impact where quickly we will be able to see the results or are we more on a long term planning where it will take a lot of time uh, to see the actual effects that the that the measures taken will will actually have on the territory. So this is, is, is one question of the, the timing. Uh, and then, of course, also the, the degree of, uh, of uh, feasibility of the different actions. Uh, so again, do I have the, um, the human resources uh, necessary to implement the actions? Uh, am, as a local authority, am I the one uh, responsible uh, for directly implementing these actions or do I need the help of other um, maybe private or, or um, actors or actors that are on a higher territorial level? And if so, are there already relationships with these actors in place that I can rely on so that I know that they will help me in the implementation of this action, that they can be responsible, um, that I can assign them responsibility for uh, the implementation and, and monitoring of this action? Or there again, does there, has to be, does there have to be an initial phase of... Um, uh, creating connections with the private sector that will be concerned of raising awareness about these issues, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, the feasibility is also um, related to uh, the budget that is available uh, for the implementation of the actions. And so uh, we see that there is um, uh, basically um, different uh, ways of uh, assessing the feasibility or the benefits of uh, the different measures. And uh, so one uh, method that is often used uh, for um, public policies is that of cost benefit. Uh, and um, uh, we will see that this is not necessarily the best solution in uh, the case of an adaptation strategy. So maybe we can pass to the next slide. Thank you. So um, the difficulty with uh, cost benefits uh, analysis is that it's a purely economic assessment. So basically, we will have to assign a monetary value uh, to measure the effect uh, uh, of every action that we uh, that we will assess. So on the one hand, uh, a monetary value assigned to the cost. Uh, what is the budget that we will have to mobilize to implement this action? But then also, uh, what is basically the uh, the the benefit of this action will also have to be expressed in uh, in a monetary value, and uh, in the case of adaptation, uh, seeing that many um, uh, of the actions will uh, be uh, in linked to uh, to health, to mortality, to um, ecosystemic services, these are things that both uh, morally and technically it will be very difficult to assign a monetary value. So, for example, if you're talking about uh, human life, when we're talking about ecosystem, um, uh, ecosystemic services, et cetera, et cetera, it will be very difficult to have an economic uh, assessment of these issues. And so this is why there are different uh, methods that uh, you should consider. On the one hand, you have the cost effectiveness analysis, which also allows for a bit more flexibility because you will have the costs, um, which will be expressed in monetary values, but then the benefits can also be um, uh, expressed in different terms and in different units, not only in, in monetary values. So, for example, also the um, 
if you look at the mortality rate, for example, related to uh, heat waves, uh, then we can express the benefits in the number of deaths uh, um, that uh, we were able to uh, to limit uh, through the measures that we are taking um, and uh, what was the uh, ratio of, for example, health impacts related to a situation where we would not have taken action. So this allows also to, to uh, take into account for different actions. Um, however, what we observe is that in the field of adaptation, uh, usually the method which seems to be uh, the most used, um, especially by local uh, authorities, is that of a multi-criteria analysis, um, which really allows for uh, a bigger uh, flexibility because it's uh, like it says, it really looks at a lot of different criteria, some of them being financial, but uh, some also uh, being completely unrelated um, to uh, to financial criteria, uh, and uh, which is uh, more adapted to the really uh, cross sectoral aspect of adaptation. The fact that you will have to look at a lot of the impacts in a lot of different sectors, uh, and so uh, basically the the criteria also will be uh, multiple. And so one example of uh, multi-criteria analysis in um, the domain of adaptation that you can find is in the uh, climate change adaptation strategy of the city of Vancouver in uh, Canada. So this is also uh, a strategy that we would encourage you to take a look at. You can find most of the documents in English um, uh, online. And so uh, this can also give you some examples of how uh, the city of Vancouver uh, uh, built up their action plan and what were the criteria that they used um, to uh, assess the different actions uh, that they implemented. So you have one example here on the screen. And though on the next slide, um, uh, yes, we also uh, have some examples of the different criteria um, that you could use for uh, the multi-criteria multi analysis of your action portfolio. Uh, so, um, so on the one hand, of course, you still look at the cost benefit ratio uh, when it is possible, uh, but um, you also see uh, look at things which are much more difficult to to quantify, like the uh, political uh, acceptability. So which is, again, related to the level of awareness already present in the local authority. Um, but also um, the, uh, the benefit of uh, preparing action uh, before uh, the the risk or the negative impacts already hit in order to avoid future damage costs, for example, um, and to look at the uh, efficiency and the effectiveness of uh, the different measures that you want to implement to, to deliver adaptation. So this is just to give you basically um, uh, an example of the of the criteria that that you can apply for for your your analysis. And uh, so, yeah, this was uh, maybe a bit of uh, methodolic, um, methodological um, introduction, and uh, I will uh, give the floor to Sandra for the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Francesca. Um, now, uh, we, um, we propose to see uh, the question, uh, the, um, uh, the different option of uh, adaptation you can uh, select in order to counteract the uncertainty. We talk about no regret, low regret, and uh, we win uh, options uh, in order to uh, select uh, adaptation action. Uh, these uh, types of um, action could be uh, also um, uh, articulated with the uh, set of uh, criteria presented by uh, Francesca. Um, for example, uh, no regret uh, adaptation op option uh, concerns uh, action, concern action uh, that will be always uh, uh, efficient, uh, whatever uh, uh, the climate change uh, will be. Um, low regret action uh, are uh, relatively low cost and uh, provide uh, relatively large benefits under predicted future uh, climates. And uh, we win options concerns the adaptation options which uh, articulate uh, co-benefits in uh, several uh, domains, social, economical, uh, environmental uh, um, uh, domain. Uh, so it's uh, also interesting to have this view in order uh, to uh, select the uh, adaptation action to counteract the uncertainty 
and uh, also to uh, optimize uh, the solution you can uh, develop on your uh, own uh, territory. Um, Francisca, uh, um, present you uh, the process to uh, uh, establish your uh, portfolio, uh, uh, your action plan, uh, first uh, uh, initial uh, action plan to uh, a final uh, action plan. And this is uh, an illustration uh, on how you can uh, organize or represent this uh, action plan with um, the um, the objective with the um, with the um, characterization of the strategic objective uh, rely on, on uh, a link to uh, operational and uh, action uh, uh, in order to answer to this uh, to this uh, different uh, uh, strategic uh, objectives uh, you have uh, an uh, an example here with the uh, domain of the water uh, the first uh, um, aim is to improve the quant quantitative and qualitative management of water resources, which is declined on the several strategic objectives, for example, reduce human and material damages, which is uh, also declined in uh, uh, several operational obje objectives and uh, actions. So it, this uh, illustration is uh, to help you to organize the way you can uh, structure your uh, your uh, action plan. To make uh, your action plan operational, you can uh, detail each action organized in an action sheet. Um, uh, uh, this uh, action uh, sheet could be perceived as a guarantee to uh, realize your action because uh, a project manager, a service department uh, uh, is defined, uh, the means are uh, estimated and, uh, and the indicator are uh, also uh, defined. Um, what we uh, observed, uh, some international uh, re study reports, the lack of uh, concretization of the adaptation action. Uh, if uh, uh, they note the progress of the planification with the uh, energy action plan and uh, so on, uh, the challenge now is to operate to engage uh, the uh, adaptation on the, on the territories. Um, another illustration in order to link the uh, different level of the action plan with the uh, indicator. Here, the example uh, refers to the uh, awareness, uh, refers to the formation in a given uh, region. Um, and for example, um, a strategy objective um, linked to this, uh, to this uh, aim uh, is the uh, is to raise awareness on adaptation issues among elected officials and territorial decision makers. And the uh, indicator uh, uh, which could be used is the number of people reached by uh, trainings or information campaigns and so on. Um, this illustration is also to help you to uh, organize uh, the information and to uh, uh, define what kind of indicators could you uh, could help you to uh, um, uh, assess uh, different uh, um, several uh, objectives, operational and uh, strategic uh, objectives. Um, we can wonder what uh, are the, pur the, the purpose of the indicators. Uh, we have already uh, said, but uh, the, in the indicators uh, allow us to check the adaptation pathway. Uh, don't forget, we have uh, uh, talk about the adaptation adaptive management uh, so it's a way to understand if we are on the on the good way uh, the indicators um, uh, allow us to understand the efficacy of the actions implementation uh, um, um, is a way to appreciate the needs for uh, adjustment of, of the uh, actions and uh, it's uh, also a way to give a transparent framework to stakeholders and, uh, and the population. And so 
uh, this element uh, is linked to the evaluative question we are talking about, uh, Francisca is talking about at the beginning of this uh, presentation. Um, another way to consider the uh, uh, the assessment, the indicator, uh, uh, there is an alternative approach which is called budget climate assessment. Uh, this uh, approach is developed by I4C. Uh, it's a French think tank uh, uh, which are which um, has developed this uh, alternative approach to appreciate the involvement of a local authority. Um, and this method is the, based on the budget budget uh, climate, which is are uh, used for uh, finance uh, some. Uh, uh, some uh, public uh, policies um, is not an evaluation based on the impacts of the adaptation. It's uh, it's really an evaluation based on the, the uh, process, uh, how the local authority uh, is engaged in uh, an adaptation uh, an adaptation process. It's uh, it's quite interesting to have this uh, uh, this view. Uh, what we can say also it's. Um, uh, to assess, to evaluate uh, the impacts of uh, a policy in adaptation, it's uh, very difficult because uh, we, for most of the action, we can't see the results in uh, in short term. Uh, we have to um, uh, we have to uh, this action can take time, uh, for example, for the forest, and it's very difficult to um, evaluate if this uh, strategy and the action have a good uh, effects and we need time to uh, consider it. So uh, sometimes uh, monitoring and evaluation could be operate regarding the process uh, to have a, um, a view of the of the way the local authority um, engage uh, the uh, adaptation on the uh, on their uh, public uh, policies. Um, another illustration we would like to share with you is uh, uh, about the means. Um, I foresee uh, the same uh, structure we um, uh, we refer. Um, have. Um, suggest a representation of the cost uh, about adaptation and you have uh, three uh, components. Uh, you have the components of uh, environmental cost, uh, which means uh, uh, the condition to uh, um, um, to to develop uh, uh, the, the action we need to prepare uh, the local authority, the stakeholders, we need to um, um, to develop the formation, uh, the sensibilization, the awareness about uh, adaptation. This is the first group of cost. We have uh, the second group uh, is uh, concerned the project cost, uh, which will be uh, dedicated to a study, to the project engineering. And the last uh, group uh, concerned the uh, project uh, implementation. Uh, it could be interesting to have uh, also this um, uh, element in mind in order to understand what kind of cost uh, you can be, um, uh, you, you, you have to prepare uh, to develop your, uh, your adaptation uh, strategy. Um, we also uh, share you um, uh, an interesting ratio uh, which is developed by uh, an international organization, uh, the Global Commission on Adaptation, and the, um, it, um, this organization um, uh, um, offers a new uh, argument uh, to uh, engage uh, adaptation uh, policy uh, by uh, because with the, this, the demonstration that uh, uh, investing in adaptation it will will uh, generate could generate uh, uh, benefits more important than the first uh, investment and uh, this is uh, we are in the same philosophy as uh, the Stern uh, report and so it could be interesting to have this uh, argument uh, to. Uh, uh, to develop uh, adaptation uh, process. Um, 
we think that the most important is to start uh, to develop some action uh, in line with the main uh, text uh, uh, to have identify uh, some uh, uh, the, the, the the project managers the department which uh, will be uh, responsible to uh, for the development of this uh, action um, it's important to um, at the beginning, uh, we already uh, said uh, to organize the concertation, to organize the governance, to organize the transparency uh, between uh, each uh, uh, stakeholders uh, regarding the adaptation uh, process. And um, and we are always in process when we are on the an adaptation uh, uh, strategy. We need to improve uh, knowledge, uh, maybe to conduct uh, new uh, new studies to uh, better understand some uh, phenomena. Um, we already said that it's a question of territory, local question, and uh, and we we have seen uh, through the example that the vulnerability is not only a question of uh, of uh, climate. Uh, we have to consider some uh, social and economic uh, characteristic of the uh, of the uh, territory. Um, maybe to conclude, just one uh, one slide regarding the uh, Ile de France uh, area. The uh, Institut Paris Region uh, have conducted a study to understand how the adaptation is integrated in the Energy Climate Action Plan in uh, Ile-de-France area. And uh, we observed that the adaptation is not the most important uh, regarding the volume uh, of action. And we note uh, also that the adaptation, adaptation actions are mainly um, linked to soft uh, actions uh, as um, this is a, a, a types of action which uh, describe uh, Francisca uh, uh, just uh, uh, in, in during the the presentation. Soft actions uh, is uh, linked to um, uh, managerial uh, policy uh, uh, um, uh, action, and uh, we see that we need to um, uh, develop this uh, action uh, before we can engage some uh, operational uh, action. And this observation for Ile de France area uh, are mainly the same in uh, other uh, other regions in uh, in the world. Um, that's that's we can say that. Um, I would like to add something about uh, this uh, uh, adaptation module. Uh, we have um, uh, declined develop this module. Uh, at the European level in uh, three cycles. We developed this module in uh, uh, national and regional uh, replication. Uh, during this, um, this uh, uh, formation, we have time to develop some exercise about uh, indicators. Uh, we have time also to, uh, uh, to conduct uh, a practical exercise. We have uh, uh, developed a climate stake uh, cart game, which uh, uh, it's a tool uh, in order to help to define some uh, uh, the main stakes at the level of uh, the territory. Uh, this morning you have a, a concentrated overview of uh, of uh, all these uh, elements and uh, uh, maybe. Uh, 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 it's difficult for the interaction, but uh, it's uh, to give you uh, an overview of the kind of exercise we have uh, developed uh, during this uh, uh, this uh, learning course. And we uh, we observe and we note that uh, the participants of uh, different uh, countries um, uh, indicate uh, the same um, difficulties or the same levers uh, to engage or to go on on the uh, adaptation uh, process. Uh, we have to um, uh, continue to awareness the, um, the, the the question of adaptation um, uh, specifically to the uh, elected uh, uh, officials. We have to continue to uh, <coughs> sorry to uh, explain uh, to uh, create uh, conditions to uh, go on uh, on uh, uh, on adaptation. Uh, 
Uh, we also note that the use of the cartography, it's a good tool uh, to understand the main stakes uh, at the level of the territory. If you have the possibility uh, to develop this tool, it's very uh, interesting. And, um, and now uh, we can now uh, present uh, the two, uh, two feedbacks. Um, we have uh, uh, we have um, uh, developed um, during this learning course. We we have uh, sorry yes excuse me. Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Just to say maybe before we pass to the um, to the case studies, um, there's one question about the different types of adaptation um, actions. If you don't mind. Uh, where it says that uh, we see that there's a, donc, uh, a large share of the adaptations actions in Ile-de-France, uh, which are soft actions. And uh, so the question is, if, if you expect for this share to decline over time in favor of green and gray actions, once the phase of awareness, uh, analysis and planning is more advanced. So basically how, how this will evolve this balance between uh, soft actions, uh, gray and, and green actions. If this is maybe also a marker of a lack of awareness at this stage uh, to, to pass to more operational uh, actions. Um, yes, alors, what we can um, uh, analyze uh, regarding this uh, uh, adaptation action uh, is uh, the link between the, some uh, different um, uh, uh, planification. Uh, there is the idea to uh, link, uh, for example, the energy action climate plan with the uh, urban um, uh, planning uh, document. And uh, I think it's a way to prepare uh, some uh, operational uh, action, but uh, um, it, takes, uh, it, it, it takes time and uh, there is a difficulty in um, the local authority because the domains are considered uh, separately often the time. And uh, I think um, the, the action which um, the objective is uh, to link this uh, uh, planification, it's uh, a way to, um, to, to facilitate uh, the this uh, transversa transversality and to um, uh, prepare public policies to develop operational action, especially for the uh, urban planning and the um, re refurbishment. But um, we are, um, we, we, we can observe uh, an important needs of uh, uh, awareness and uh, sensibilization uh, concerning the uh, elected uh, officials. Uh, we can observe a confusion uh, between uh, mitigation and adaptation that's not facilitate the development of an adaptation uh, strategy. Um, I think now we um, there is an important uh, um, a point regarding the, um, the green action and the development of a nature-based solution uh, in order to refresh the, the town. And, uh, and now maybe these actions are more... Um, uh, uh, we pay attention to develop this, uh, this uh, action, which is more uh, an operational uh, um, uh, way to adapt. And maybe if I can add on that, I think what is also um, often said when we talk with the local authorities in our region, but also uh, in other European countries uh, in the context of this project, is that we see that often there is a high demand uh, to have concrete case studies for uh, solutions that have been implemented um, somewhere else to understand uh, what are the costs, what are the actual impacts, what are maybe also like a, a methodology to correctly implement uh, this solution, we see we have um, some colleagues from the uh, Regional Agency for Biodiversity, which also kind of um, monitor and um, collect uh, the kind of different projects for nature-based solutions which are being implemented in, in the regions or, or, or at the national level in France. And so they also see that sometimes there are projects uh, that are being implemented, but there will just be little mistakes uh, in uh, the way that um, the project has been planned, which finally will make it ineffective. Uh, so I think there is also uh, a high demand to have um, 
more knowledge to share experience and to really have kind of um, uh, solutions that can be reproduced easily. Um, and so I think there's also just this difficulty to say, okay, we don't want to be the first ones to implement these solutions because we don't, or these kind of projects because we don't necessarily understand uh, what to do. We cannot necessarily justify this um, uh, in front of the local um, elected officials because we we don't know, understand exactly the costs, etc. So I think uh, these are things that will also develop more and more that other case studies become available um, and that will be able to magnify also the, the solutions that once there's more experience available and that uh, it will be more easy to uh, duplicate, reproduce uh, the these kind of projects. Okay, uh, thank you, Francisca. Um, so uh, during this uh, learning course, we have the opportunity to create some uh, uh, testimony videos, and uh, we would like to share with you the the video of uh, Cascais, which is a, a Port Portuguese local uh, authority. So just I take few minutes in order to uh, to. Uh, share this uh, video. Uh, no. Sorry, just a few minutes in order we um, we manage some technical uh, uh, problem and so and then Francisca will present you the video of uh, the, the the feedback of Paris. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is João Diniz. I work for Cascais Ambiente in Portugal, and I'm responsible for the climate action initiatives in the city of Cascais. Today, I will share you our work on climate adaptation in our city. And uh, to let you know that we are a very rich, uh, culturally rich uh, municipality, over 100 square kilometers, 30 kilometers of coastline, and uh, one third of our area is protected landscape. So we are on the west side of the Lisbon metropolitan area. And because of all this natural resources that we have, we have um, unrivaled heritage that is completely guided, successfully guided towards tourism. But we've been facing some climate change issues in the last decade, some of them already quite visible and increasing on intensity and also frequency. So we are tackling that challenge with studies. So back in 2009, we've made one, what is considered one of the first assessments on local climate uh, change impacts and scenarios through a reg regionalization of uh, the climate uh, uh, impacts. But we immediately started to work. After we have this, we had this, um, this strategy, we worked together with numerous teams from the town hall, from local stakeholders, local universities, schools and so on and citizens alike to tackle all this very broad range of initiatives. And we've done this thanks to the European Union support as well, financial support grants, but also some other national or regional uh, grants as well to implement these innovative actions that uh, municipalities have now to, to implement. However, it was by 2017 that we've developed our action plan for climate adaptation. And we've done this because we needed to have a bit more of um, a structure on our work. We need to prepare financially our work for the next uh, 13 years. And it's something that it's completely crucial for us uh, to, to implement. Um, we don't have time to, to waste on this. We have to act as swiftly as possible because this is comprised not only in the Paris Agreement by 2015, but also on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, namely the Goal 13. So we've done workshops, we work together with a lot of, of uh, NGOs, a lot of 
stakeholders and also citizens and schools alike just to help us design what is the climate structure, the climate action structure. Why is that? Because on each sector is a wide range of stakeholders that are specialized in that sector only. So we need to get the best knowledge possible towards a driven and successful action. And uh, another innovative action that we've learned is that we need to translate what is the, the scientific knowledge and language into the language that our stakeholders can relate to. So they need to understand what are the, the, the impacts that they're facing and how this will create additional risks or vulnerabilities on their own uh, line of work for the coming years. So we came out with uh, a plan that has 13 measures and each one of them will be implemented by a set of 82 actions. So this is a over 11 million euros of investment. And we've learned that most of the adaptation actions are actually non-structure or green solutions. The gray solutions in the case of Kashkais are mostly for the water supply industry. And interestingly, they all reply very transversely to the sustainable development goals by 2030. So just to give you a few examples, we have five sectors of work. So the first one was adaptation and education, where we work together with, uh, with schools to, to reach our students, to, te to reach our, uh, our teaching community, to update their knowledge, to bring the entrepreneurship um, stakeholders as well, to help us to develop the green economy, the carbon neutral economy, but also to create awareness on public space. So we've done a lot of art exhibits, photographic exhibits as well. And uh, we've worked in single competitions for, for children, for adults, but also by training. So capacity building for, for workers or, or residents or even tourists in Kishkai. So everybody is invited and have an opportunity to know more about the climate action that we have, including the support, the financial support to our own NGOs for them to develop their own initiative. So this is quite innovative because we, the municipality, are, are supporting NGOs to do their own adaptation. Uh, the second sector is water resources. And like mentioned, here in our specific case, according to our human and physical geography, we need to better our water supply system to reduce water losses, but also to create uh, efficiency because, well, we're, we're facing uh, more recurrent and more severe droughts year by year, and we need to make sure that we use water as swiftly as possible, including the use of recycled water in uh, what we call non-noble activities. Then the third sector, which is civil protection and health. So this comprises a wide range of activities that go from weather and climate monitoring, which is available for every citizen around the world. You can even use our data to, to do your own assessments and do your own studies, and it's all available online. We've been registering uh, these situations in case of floods, for example, in case of fires, how were the, the weather conditions that originated all these uh, extreme weather events and the impacts that they caused, but also through forest management, vigilance, not only in the summer, but all over the year now, because unfortunately with the droughts, this is quite required. And um, also the, the campaigns to inform beach goers or, or the vulnerable communities, for example, the elderly, when there's a heat wave, for example, what you should do and uh, take care of yourself on these days. For example. So these are just a few examples of what we're doing. Then um, we have the sector for ecological infrastructure and resilient urban green space. This is quite a transformative approach for us because like many cities, we are also responsible for managing the green infrastructure and uh, local green space. But what we need is to completely redesign the way that we are producing or managing these green spaces because we need to make them more water efficient and to promote biodiversity, which is another reason that we're facing. So we've done a lot of initiatives to promote our autochthonous species. We work together with a lot of volunteers for reforestation activities. We have manuals and regulation now that help us to our professionals to adapt uh, to this new reality. But not only on these green spaces, but also, for example, on green corridors, which is one of the a few images that you see here that can also contribute uh, significantly to the quality of life and risk mitigation of climate change. Uh, and this obviously has been 
developed with uh, numerous stakeholders again, but also with partner municipalities, our neighboring municipalities or other cities that are working on the subject. So we can leverage our knowledge, but also share knowledge and learn from the city. So this is a completely let's call it, global approach of global learning. Uh, just a few examples of what we've been doing, which is, for example, uh, green corridors that are flooded areas. And in just as soon as the, the flooding passes, all our trails or green infrastructure is already read, um, available for usage with safety for all citizens and uh, without as little damage as possible. So lastly, uh, spatial planning. So this is to make sure that our regulation allows or foments or, or is updated to the criteria that climate adaptation requires or when it comes to urban and spatial planning, but also uh, housing regulation. So we need to make sure that what that we understand what are the areas that are most vulnerable uh, and save them. And this is something that our master plan and other regulations have. So finally, um, because this climate action is such a transversal uh, challenge, we do feel that team coordination and uh, leveling the knowledge that people have are uh, quite an unexpected challenge that we had, but we successfully uh, surpassed it through uh, a management approach where, where uh, there's a commission that works nearly full time on this. Um, we also consider that nature-based solutions tackle most vulnerabilities. So complete, this is about greening the city and it's actually quite helpful to have this very synthetic way of, of, of uh, thinking. Um, we must include climate actions in our planning and in our regulations. So this is the only way that we can save ourselves for the future and uh, to make sure that our territory is prepared for that. And uh, finally, this is quite a transformative spirit and it's about bringing innovation to city management. And obviously everyone that works with city is keen to keep on working with this. And uh, obviously it's, it's something that we need to develop, not only the actions, but the way that we work together. And uh, this concludes my presentation. I do hope you've, uh, you've enjoyed the presentation and uh, let me know if you have any questions in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, so um, we, we, we have uh, shared with you this, uh, this video because we think it's a good um, uh, illustration of what we've developed uh, this morning uh, regarding the notion of uh, process of adaptation, the involvement of the stakeholders, uh, the, the, to create a common vision, to, um, uh, to organize uh, the, uh, the strategy, the notion of, uh, of the types of action, and we think it was a good illustration in order you can uh, project uh, yourself on your own uh, territory and your own uh, organization. Now we, uh, Francisca, uh, 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 present you the uh, adaptation strategy of the city of Paris. It's an, another level of uh, local authority, but I think it's quite interesting uh, regarding the, um, the elements we uh, developed this morning. Um, so I share uh, my screen. And uh, it's okay, uh, Francesca? Yes? Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Sandra. So uh, basically the idea is not to give a complete overview of uh, uh, the whole adaptation strategy uh, implemented in, in, in the city of Paris because it would, would take a lot of time and it, it, talk, uh, it touches on a lot of different sectors and issues. Uh, for us, it was interesting maybe to focus on the issue of urban heat which is of course a, a major challenge for uh, uh, for the city of Paris, but also for uh, the region in general, because uh, it is very dense, uh, very mineral, and so uh, the urban heat is really a, a very big problem, and uh, which is, I think, also uh, one of the effects of climate change that people are really starting, like, are already seeing, already feeling, and so it, it, it is also something that people really identify uh, with this issue of, of, of climate change, which was maybe less, um, um, less visible uh, until now. 
uh, yeah, so um, uh, what is interesting is also maybe to look at the the, the process, the way uh, the, the the city developed uh, its strategy. Um, knowing that uh, um, in, in in Paris, um, uh, in France, sorry, Paris was rather early, one of the earlier uh, local authorities that um, started working on uh, this issue of uh, of climate change and and adaptation. Uh, and so the starting point uh, that we could identify is maybe like the first um, local uh, climate plan, which was uh, adopted by the city of Paris in 2007. And uh, what you have to understand is that um, the, uh, the, the process of um, developing, writing uh, this very first action plan uh, was very highly influenced by an extreme weather event uh, which happened in France in 2003, uh, which was very um, one of the most important uh, heat waves uh, that the country um, was uh, confronted with in, in, in recent times, which uh, had a very, very um, strong uh, health uh, impact for a large part of the population, which was uh, especially um, important impact on the city of Paris, which a uh, high mortality rate uh, of of uh, uh, mortality rate uh, related to um, to the extreme heat, uh, and so it was a uh, yeah quite an um, extreme experience for France in general, but also for 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 Paris in in, in particular, uh, and so this was also um, one of the reasons which contributed to um, to the fact that the effects of extreme climate. Uh, were already addressed in uh, this first uh, climate plan of 2007, and that especially the issue of urban heat was really um, very much on everybody's mind, uh, with a number of first actions that were taken in place, especially to have guidelines and an action plan um, to uh, react to uh, extreme heat events, for example. Uh, so yeah, that the people said, okay, we really um, want uh, to make sure that this does not happen again uh, in this way and that people will not be affected uh, in such an extreme way and that people, especially the most vulnerable, so the youngest and elderly people will, will be more protected um, in, in case of uh, extreme, uh, extreme heat waves. Um, and so um, one of the... Um, Things that resulted of this was that the city of Paris decided or identified that they needed more information of uh, uh, on the uh, phenomenon of uh, urban heat islands, and so um, they participated in uh, a research program uh, to uh, better understand uh, this uh, phenomenon and uh, its effects on uh, the city of, of Paris. Um, yes, so. Um, uh, uh, after that, um, if we go to the next slide. Um, so based on the uh, results, uh, also partly um, coming from this research project, uh, there was the um, formalization of a, a climate change adaptation policy, uh, which took place uh, between 2012 and 2015 with the, adapta with the uh, adoption of uh, the first um, strategy really dedicated to climate change adaptation in 2015. Um, and uh, it was uh, the, a strategy with um, 65 uh, actions uh, in, in an action plan, um, which were aiming, uh, so actions to be implemented by uh, 2020 and others also more a long-term vision uh, with the horizon of, of 2050. Uh, and so it was a very uh, participative uh, process as well with a lot of different stakeholders uh, associated to uh, this process in order to identify uh, the different risks. Um, and uh, in general, it was organized around uh, four main uh, thematic axes uh, to uh, protect Parisians in the context of extreme climate events. And so then, uh, again, the link of, of what I said uh, to the extreme heat waves, to guarantee food, water um, and energy supply for the city, um, how to live uh, with climate change, so basically the, the sustainable de development of, of the city, uh, and also to uh, strengthen um, uh, solidarity uh, among uh, the population, which a specific with a specific focus on um, most vulnerable uh, populations, um, 
because this was also something which was identified kind of of how to assess the adaptive capacity of well of the of the population and where you see that of course the different uh, population groups will not be confronted in the same way uh, to the extreme uh, climate events um, and uh, of course uh, a special focus on the elderly population but also on uh, the um, homeless population uh, which is also a big challenge um, in the city of Paris and of course also people which are the least protected uh, in uh, in the case of extreme climate events. So this again kind of um, creates a link of uh, what we presented before of uh, really this more uh, socioeconomic uh, dimension of the adaptation strategy uh, that you have to understand how uh, different population groups will be affected by the measures implemented uh, and how maybe they will also have to be protected differently uh, regarding to their specific uh, vulnerabilities uh, and to make sure that they are not excluded uh, from the from the measures that are being taken, which is of course a, a high risk for, for uh, homeless people, for example. Uh, if we go on to the to the next uh, slide, uh, so um, this uh, um, adaptation uh, uh, strategy um, was then also um, one of the elements which was of course taken into account into the updated um, local climate plan of the city of Paris, which was published in 2018. Uh, and so here you can see uh, an example of uh, what we were mentioning in the beginning of an integrated uh, strategy which um, combines uh, the issues of uh, mitigation on the one hand and adaptation on the other. So the objective was really to have a, a global strategy which would um, uh, uh, integrate uh, these two um, sides of, uh, of climate change. Uh, on the next slide. Um, the next step was basically to update the uh, territorial vulnerability assessment. Uh, so to update uh, the strategy that was adopted in 2015, which was then a, a, a process, uh, again, a participative uh, open uh, approach um, done between 2020 and 2021, which um, allowed to have an updated um, vision of uh, how the vulnerability had evolved in the city. And uh, if we go to the next slide, we see that, um, uh, yes, that um, a lot of different uh, climate hazards uh, were assessed uh, to better understand what their impacts were. So like I said, I will be talking a lot about extreme heat, but um, the idea was also to look about uh, uh, the impact of, of, of rainfall, of extreme uh, rain, of drought, of uh, flooding, etc., uh, etc., et but also extreme cold, for example, and to see how all of these different um, hazards uh, will evolve on the territory. And I think what is also important is uh, that there was a big focus on um, how the different systems and resources could be impacted uh, and uh, how vulnerable they are to the different climate hazards. So in Paris, this is a very big issue because, well, I think this is probably the case for most uh, big cities, which are very dense, have a very large population, uh, but a very constrained territory, which means that um, most of the resources um, are taken from outside of the actual territory of Paris. So for example, for water, for energy, from food, it will all be brought to the city from outside. So um, there is also this necessity to see uh, what, on the one hand, what the larger effects are. So also looking outside of one's territory, because this is where part or a big part of the resources are coming from. But then also how these logistic change chains, sorry, that um, manage to um, transport the different resources from the outside territories into the city, uh, how they could be affected. Because then very quickly, of course, if the if the water, uh, energy, or, or food systems um, would break down, this would uh, very quickly have a very, very negative effects on, uh, on the population. Uh, yeah, so this is the, the, the different um, points that were, uh, that were seen. Some of the big results um, or some of the, the, the big um, things that uh, were found when updating this uh, vulnerability analysis uh, was to see that um, uh, 
uh, you could really observe how the average maximal and minimal temperatures are increasing in the cities. Uh, and especially uh, one takeaway from the city was that they saw that the uh, the threshold, which is kind of very symbolic threshold of the two degrees, was already exceeded um, at the level of the city, so that they were already um, uh, yeah, really um, confronted with uh, important uh, warming. Uh, and of course, that uh, things would would um, increase and, and get even worse uh, in the future. So I think this was also in terms of uh, raising awareness and communication, both to the elected officials and to the, the population, uh, was quite important to uh, show uh, how strongly you can already observe the, these changes. Um, and another takeaway, uh, which is on the next slide. Thank you. And another text, um, takeaway uh, was also um, that when they compared... Um, the vulnerability assessment carried out between uh, 2012 and 2015, and now this new uh, vulnerability assessment carried out uh, in 2020, uh, that the risks that they had initially identified in 2012 were uh, actually um, accelerated uh, on a much more uh, accelerated um, calendar than what they had initially anticipated, uh, which means that basically they thought that some of the um, amplitude or extremes effects that they were in, uh, expecting for um, a time frame of about uh, 2050 would already start to occur in 2030. So um, I think it's a real link of maybe what we saw also in the very beginning, where we saw that a lot of you chose uh, the picture of the clock uh, to represent uh, adaptation, your representation of, of, of adaptation. And uh, this is something that uh, the city of Paris really experienced to see that, okay, we actually have less time to prepare than what we initially thought. Uh, and so we also uh, have to accelerate uh, basically the measures that we will implement to uh, face uh, these kind of risks uh, that will uh, come much earlier than than what we could have expected. So I think this is also uh, interesting to see how uh, they evolved and how they then had to adjust also their action plan to take into account a much more important amplitude of, um, of risks than what they um, initially would have expected. Um, and so uh, now maybe just to give you a few examples uh, on the next slide, yes, uh, of some of the actions that are implemented. Um, so, um, of course, uh, the, the city is uh, working a lot on uh, different solutions, uh, both um, more technological and like very um, simple solutions to uh, create shade, to uh, reduce heat uh, in uh, the urban spaces. In general, the city is very mineral uh, and there are some areas where there's a lack of, of green spaces. So then uh, the question is, yeah, what are the kind of alternative solutions that can be put in place? Uh, one uh, solution that is also being experimented both on roofs and on uh, streets is um, a type of white uh, reflective paint um, in order to better uh, reflect uh, the heat um, in summer and uh, where uh, the areas where this has been experimented, you um, they measured a real difference in terms of temperature, so that it really um, allows to reduce uh, the maximal temperature during uh, heat waves, and also has um, some positive benefits, uh, co-benefits on terms of acoustics, that it would also reduce the noise on uh, streets, for example, where there are a lot of cars, then this will also um, uh, reduce the noise levels for the people that are living there. Um, another example um, that... Um, we wanted to share uh, is again uh, in the communication with the population and also communicating to them uh, where they can find uh, resources and um, to kind of increase their adaptive capacity in, in, in times of extreme heat. And so one of the tools that was uh, developed with the uh, Parisian uh, Climate Agency um, was to have an interactive map of the different uh, locations where uh, Parisians can find shade and also cool down during heat waves. Uh, so, for example, what are the public buildings where uh, people can go if they don't, uh, if their um, housing is too hot? Um, and also in the different parks and green spaces, uh, the details about the different levels of vegetation to see uh, how much cooling the different green spaces actually provide. And so on the one hand, of course, this allows um, people to better identify the places where they can go uh, when it gets too hot uh, in their houses. Uh, but on the other hand, for the city, it also uh, manages to see which are maybe the areas which are very densely populated, but where there's also a lack uh, of green spaces or other cooling options uh, that have to be developed to make sure that everybody has access uh, to this uh, to these solutions everywhere in the city. Um, 
So, and I think the last example that I wanted to share uh, is on the next. Uh, yes, it's about basically, of course, uh, one of the main um, strategies to um, to reduce the urban heat is through greening. So that they have a strong um, policy for greening, especially on public buildings, uh, with some guidelines on how to develop uh, green roofs and and walls. Uh, and more recently, also um, some uh, financial aids that they give to private uh, condominiums uh, to also help them finance projects uh, of greening in uh, uh, the big apartment buildings, um, which usually are much uh, harder to uh, to touch and to implement this kind of measures than than on the public buildings. Uh, and um, one other uh, examples uh, on uh, for schools is uh, yeah, kind of something that uh, I was talking about also in the presentation about evaluation. Uh, so there's a project which is implemented not only in, 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 in Paris, but also in other French cities, uh, which is really focusing on the school grounds. Uh, because like I said, there um, is a real issue of um, concentrating heat uh, in the school grounds that were initially designed really to be very um, yeah, just concrete, very mineral, um, no shade, uh, nothing at all. And so that um, we could see that this was having um, uh, a lot of health impacts also for uh, the students and that it was almost yeah during peak um, heat periods, almost not possible uh, for them really to spend uh, the, the time outside. Um, and so this uh, has um, given rise to a project which um, is basically uh, piloted by um, a kind of local, uh, different local committees which exist in in, uh, in most territories in France for architecture and uh, urbanism, um, who uh, are really developing these projects of greening uh, the, uh, the school yards. And so uh, initially set out to be also participative projects, so to see how really the uh, children are using uh, the yards and um, uh, try to um, yeah propose projects that on the one hand improve uh, the uh, the the quality of life for the students that are integrated into their playing patterns etc and on the other hand really to um, have less sealed and mineral soils to also uh, improve the water runoff uh, for the rain uh, and of course also have uh, much more shade and vegetation to uh, reduce the urban high, uh, heat island uh, effect in summer. And uh, so one of the aspects um, of this project was also not only to green um, the schoolyards, but also with the objective to uh, reduce the lack of green spaces in certain areas. So to say, OK, uh, we will give um, public money to help um, finance um, the renovation of the schoolyards, but um, uh, this way on the weekends or other days when the schoolyards are when the schools are not open and the yards are not being used, we also want to open them to see uh, if we can open them to the people living around to uh, basically give them access as well to additional parks and, and green spaces uh, in the heating period. So yeah, so this is also an example which has been very uh, well uh, documented, uh, which has been implemented in different cities in France. So you can also easily find uh, resources about this project uh, if you're interested in it. And I think this was uh, my last slide for, for this presentation. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you, Francisca. Uh, so uh, this uh, feedback conclude uh, this uh, learning course, this crash uh, course uh, this morning. Um, so you have uh, an overview of uh, what we develop uh, during this uh, learning course on adaptation. So uh, uh, we, uh, we have, uh, we treat not only uh, the question of indicators and data, it's important, but uh, you see we have uh, also uh, worked on the question of the notion, uh, uh, strategy, uh, vision, vocabulary, and uh, I hope this uh, element uh, could uh, help you to uh, organize your own uh, work and your own uh, strategy at the level of your territory and uh, organization. Um, all the team, all the team of Energy Watch. Uh, thank you uh, to attend this morning to this uh, representation, to this presentation, and uh, don't hesitate if you have uh, any question and if you need some uh, uh, more information. Uh, we will send you this uh, presentation in a few days. And uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I don't know if Francisca, you would like to add some. A few words. <laughs>
<laughs> okay. Maybe just to say that um, in general, uh, in the presentation, you will see that uh, we are often referencing lots of different uh, action plan strategies from different cities in Europe and around the world, uh, different method methods as well developed by think tanks or other kind of organizations. So all of this information you can also um, uh, find online. And yeah, I think really uh, it's a good idea to also take a look at uh, the different strategies or action plans developed in different cities to find uh, the concrete examples, the concrete methods, uh, etc. That uh, so you can also uh, find all of these information uh, online, which are in the presentation. Okay, so thank you, thank you, and uh, have a nice day, and um, and uh, thank you for your attention.